I felt like the only thing I can do with my life at that time was to die in combat. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> my name is Krishna America Flores. I served in the United States Marine Corps. I served from 2004 to 2008 in active duty. And I signed up, I went in open contract actually, because I wanted to leave to boot camp sooner than later. They had a slot that opened up. I got out as a corporal. I was born in New York, wow. Long Island. And my family left New York. My dad left New York and my mom kind of followed along. They kind of broke up. And he went to Los Angeles. So my mom followed him to Los Angeles when I was three years old. And I was, I grew up in LA County for most of my life. So yeah, I was born in New York. My parents migrated to the United States sometime in the late 70s. Um, they were from El Salvador. There was a civil war during that time. And my mom was, from what she tells me, <laughs> um, she was involved, like she got involved in the rebellion and the war. And at some point they were, they're like, there was a bounty on her head that they wanted her. So the family, my great, my, my grandfather, he was a famous football player in El Salvador. His wow. name is Juan Francisco Barraza. And um, they were all very concerned and they, had, they pulled together whatever money that they had from, the, they, were, they weren't very well off. Um, so they pulled together money and they sent her to the United States. My father was not in the picture for a very long time. Um, I'm, like I said, my mom was just a very, like what you would call today, toxica. <laughs> <laughs> and man, was she just a really tough woman, a tough mother, who was like, you know, she, she, made, she figured out how to be in this country, and unfortunately she never got her papers, so she was undocumented. But I don't know what happened along the way. Um, I think she started dating men that were involved in like gangs and slanging drugs and just doing things like that. So I grew up in an environment where there was a lot of drugs, guns, a lot of men around, unfortunately. And my mom was very, she, the way she showed her love to myself and my siblings later on is just by providing shelter, providing shelter. There wasn't a lot of love and nurturing type of stuff. She's a very tough woman. Um, and she she dated these men and they kind of pulled her into that world and she kind of became a very even more tough woman like a chola a thug a thug and she's the type of mom that it, when i came home crying because someone some boy was bullying me she's like you better go kick his fucking ass and if you don't come back and tell me you kicked his ass i'm gonna kick your ass i'm like <laughs> I'm being serious. This one time, my front neighbors bullied me, and I was in karate. She had put me in karate at that point. And it had been like fucking two weeks. And she's like, no, no, no. You're going to do You're going to settle this right now. We were having like a pool party, and the kids were being, the boys were being mean to me. And she's like, no, 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 in front of all the parents. You, you little effort, come here. You're going to duke it out right now. And one by one, we fucking duked it out in the backyard. Wow. I duked it with two boys. How old were you? I was in elementary school. Not in, was it elementary school or junior high? I don't know, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. Like going into junior high, you know, still, or maybe, because I know them. I met them when I was nine, so I don't know what, it, what you're doing when you're nine. Wow. Yeah, and that was my mom. And I was an only child. So um, uh, my mom, had a lot of trauma in her younger life, right? She had that exposure to combat in her country or whatever else she did. And then all the things that she did with these, you know, in that environment that she was in. And she, she dated men that were like arrested by the FBI. Um, and unfortunately she left me alone a lot. And at a very young age, she, she worked a lot, you know, she was absent, so she needed someone to watch me. And for a while it was this very nice old lady and she had her granddaughter and her son, they lived with us or nearby, and that lady would take care of me. But once they went their separate ways, um, there was this other person or friend that my mom thought would be great to leave, to be my, like my babysitter, and it was a male. 
And at a very young age, this man started like sexually abusing me. And as a kid, you don't know, you know, he would bring me like gifts, things that people don't, I wasn't getting from anyone else, you know, other than, you know, the basics, you know, roof over your head, clothes, money in your pocket, you're not starving, keep your mouth shut, don't complain. <laughs> so um, I was very young when this started and, you know, it's a little secret. And, and it just went on for a really long time. As a child, you don't know or understand. So when I reflect back, I remember being in school and like, you know, that type stimulating myself in class. I know this is ridiculous, sorry everyone. Um, but that's what was going on and I think back and I'm like, that's incredible because I remember it was in class and nobody caught it. Nobody caught all this, you know, behavior that a child shouldn't be doing. How old were you? I was super young. I was, it was like elementary. Mm. I was very young, I remember. Was the, I remember the school and I passed the school sometime because it's in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that happened for a really long time. I never spoke out about it because, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And he would give me things. So, I don't know. It felt like another adult caring for me. Yeah. I don't know what, anything else. So um, that went on for a really long time. And then sometimes he wasn't in the picture. And then unfortunately, my mom left me alone in various places. So other men also did things, unfortunately. Mm. And then older boys, too, like being left unsupervised. And then there's boys in the building, you know, and we all grow up together, but they kind of are a little older and they just, you know, do things, too. So I was just left in a very vulnerable situations with uh, no adults, usually. And when I did finally tell my mom, um, much when I was much older, about what that guy had been doing to me since I was very young, eventually he stopped when I was like pre getting into that preteen age because he knew like, oh, I can't, can't get away with this too much longer. Mm. Um, but then my mom had my baby sister. Mm. And you know, my mom was working or whatever the fudge she was doing in the day. And he would take care of her, the kids sometimes, <clears throat> most of the time, actually, uh, me too. And I was just like, what if he does this to my sister? I'm like, no. So I told my mom, and I was afraid to tell her, and because she did exactly what I thought she was going to do. She was like, wanted to kill him. Uh, I, I, the story goes that she stabbed him in the gut. The story goes. I left a couple years later because I joined the Marine Corps, and um, in Junior high and in high school, I was in ROTC. I grew up kind of watching World War II movies, and the Americans were always the heroes. So I was like, yeah, I want to be a hero. I want to be an American hero. So I grew up watching a lot of movies, like movies I shouldn't have been watching, like Platoon, which I didn't understand because I think I still saw the Americans as heroes. I was really young. I didn't really understand it. And then Band of Brothers came out, and I binge watched that when that came out on a DVD set, like on a regular on the weekends, because I just loved the brotherhood, you know, the honor, the courage, to, especially as young as they were, and everything that they encounter. I was just like, wow, I want to be that. So, you know, I got involved in ROTC in junior high. It was Army ROTC. <laughs> and I took that shit real serious. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I guess I needed an outlet, and in school, um, unfortunately, in school, I, had, I have a learning disability. But back then, it wasn't super common. They thought maybe because it was like a, bar a language barrier. It, but, you know, they would always tell my mom, like, uh, she might not graduate high school. You'll be lucky if she can even do that. She won't go to college. So they would say these kind of things in front of me, and I would believe that. So... I didn't really thrive academically, but I did in like curricular activities. So I was doing ROTC and also like cheerleading, playing other sports. I was in the band. Like in these other areas, I thrived and there were the things that like helped me escape what was going on at home, even though I wasn't the greatest student. Like I absolutely hated English and I couldn't, I just couldn't. But I also didn't know I had, you know, a, like a legit learning disability. And even today I'm slower. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, grad school, undergrad, I, it takes extra time for me to absorb information and remember information. Mm -hmm. 
So with all of that, um, I ended up barely graduating and I wanted to escape home. I always knew after 9-11, especially because the attack happened in New York and then there was a story about my dad and my mom when they first got here that they were like, they had never seen a skyscraper that tall, like from their country. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, um, my father died when I was young too. He, I was 12 when, I, when he died. And I remember when that happened, I took it very personally because I had never seen the Twin Towers. Mm. And I was like, those mother effers. And I was already in ROTC, you know, like my mind, I was already interested in joining. But when that attack happened, that's when I really, that really solidified my decision to join the military. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go check out joining the military. I'm going to sign up. I'm going to join the army originally because, you know, everything is army. Mm -hmm. And I show up super early in the morning. It's in, the, in San Fernando Valley, and they are not there. It's closed. And the Marine Corps office is right next door. And so I'm standing there just waiting. And then a Marine, one of the recruiters pops his head out. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to sign up for the Army. You know, I'm excited. And he's like, Pfft. Why the army? I'm like, they're the best. They're number one. And he's like, started laughing. He's like, what about the Marine Corps? And I was just like, mm, what about the Marine Corps? And he's like, come on then. Let me tell you about the Marine Corps. And I was like, all right. So he sits me down and he asks me, he didn't, I don't know if he asked me anything, but he starts showing me like the boot camp book. Like, look at these Marines, you get forged, not too much into it. And he's like, and you know what? I think he said something along the lines, you probably wouldn't make it anyways. Um, Cause this is, the, this is the hardest branch. It's the longest boot camp. It's, it has the fewest amount of women and the success rate, the graduation rate, you know, it, it, it's not that high. And I was just like, well, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a challenge, boot camp. You likely were at Paris Island. Yes, sir. I was at Paris Island. You know, I don't really remember a lot. I just remember we were up for a really, really long time. And we would wait a lot for things. And once something did start happening, it was a lot. Like you had to get all of your materials, your chonies, your socks, do the count and all that stuff. So it was a lot. And then you would stop and wait. And it was a lot of that. And there was a point where they, they sit you in a room, you have all the stuff, and you're about to like be put somewhere to get some, some rest. And it's like the moment, the golden hour or the, the moment of truth or something like that, where they ask you, is there anything you didn't tell your recruiter? Mm, the amnesty hour, huh? That. And I was like, fuck. I didn't tell him about a head trauma. <laughs> I did not disclose a head trauma that I had as a kid. I had a super gnarly head trauma where like, I lost my memory for two days. I didn't remember my mom or my dad. Really? Yes. What, and What happened? Um, <clears throat> it was, um, I was at a, my elementary school during that period of time where I was being abused. And I was walking out to the playground. And they were playing softball way across the field. And a TA hit... A hardball and that hardball hit the side of my head and I was out I was out I would I was out I remember coming to a few times and like throwing up and going back to sleep and being like super scared I'm like what's going on and then I'd pass out again and I ended up at Children's Hospital in, in LA where um, they sedated me did I remember a little bit of that stuff too and I remember throwing up a lot and um, I came to, I guess at some point, my mom said that I did not recognize her or my dad. And I started freaking out and crying. So they had to date me again. She said the next time I woke up that I remembered them. Mm. So I was like, thank goodness. But I was bilingual. I learned in English at school and at home. You know, my mom spoke in Spanish and she yelled a lot in Spanish. 
So that's how I learned Spanish. I picked it up just at home. I never really got went to school for it or like know the alphabet, but I can carry a whole freaking conversation. And um, when that ha injury happened, I had to like relearn how to write, how to read, I had a TA. And that's really where the, the learning disability comes from. Wow. It's from that trauma. <laughs> so yeah, that impacted my, 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 academ my academic mm. career yeah, as a kid. So here you are in boot camp yeah. and you're about to confess this? Yeah. And of course I get dropped. No way. Of course. Heck yeah, they have to clear me. They're like, well, we have to clear you because I had that hair trauma. So I had to go get cleared by a neurologist. And I also disclosed that I do have flat feet. I really do, but I guess they didn't catch it. Um, so they dropped me and I got dropped to what they call the broke platoon or the broke D platoon. And that's where I met um, someone that I didn't know would be my best friend. Mm. One of my best friends. Uh, someone that we would end up in the same shop, the same unit, the same shop, same MOS. Wow. And yeah, and together at the same time when we were, when I was in Okinawa in, in, in the fleet and they asked us for vol who would like to volunteer to deploy to Iraq. Her and I were standing right next to each other and we were just like, and I was like, yeah. Wow. Yeah, there was only three of us that raised our hands out of my Motor T platoon. So how long did you have to stay in the, um, the medical? Did they call it MRP, Medical Rehabilitation Platoon? I think it was. Yes, I think okay. you're absolutely correct there. And um, yeah, I went there and, you know, I got a little experience of that side of boot camp. They still yelled at you. They still played around, mm -hmm. played games and all that stuff. They just, it was, just wasn't super physically demanding because you're, you're in recovery. Yeah. Like when I would do the PT in the mornings, they'd be like, why is Flores running so fast? Is a mock PFT. But my legs weren't broken. <laughs> you know, like there's nothing wrong with me. I'm here to get cleared. So I was still going full speed. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I was there not too long, I think, just, a, just about like two weeks maybe or three weeks, but mm. it felt like an eternity to me. Boot camp was was. was I loved every second of it. I loved learning how to break down the rifle, putting it together, breaking it apart, putting it together, breaking it apart. Anything that was physical or like involved my hands, I felt really confident in it. Mm. But when it came to that knowledge that we have to read and know and that test that we have to take, that was the one thing that I was super sweating about. And let me tell you, I was scribe this one time and you know how they give you the lunch boxes and sometimes they don't give you enough time to eat. Mm -hmm. So you're like, oh, fuck it. Put something in my pocket. So I had a granola bar in my pocket and I'll never freaking forget this shit. I was scribe. Scribe! Pen! So I reach into my cargo pocket because it was the only thing I could have in there. It was the only pocket I could use. And I pull out this Ziploc bag with pins and a granola bar. <laughs> oh. Yep. And the granola bar. And she looks at me. She takes that shit. She's like, you, you're the new scribe. You, go fuck off somewhere. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> and then we get back to the bay. And she does a whole lecture. It was, I don't remember. Was it our senior? I think it was our senior. Because I remember we were, okay, it was the whole thing. So... So we get back to the bay and she's all talking about integrity and how, you know, we need to do what we're told and who else, who else has not followed one of the Marine Corps rules? Who else? And another recruit steps forward. Mm. Oh, oh, get it, go get it, go get it. And we're all standing there and I was like, oh shit, it was that <laughs> And she comes out and she had a little peanut butter, the little peanut butter. I'm very familiar with those. Yeah. So our senior grabs it. She leaves us there, standing in attention, wondering what. And she comes out with her green belt on. Our senior comes out with her green, her green belt hat. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It was like a whole freaking thing. Um, we tore up the bay. She made us grab our guide on and roll it up with the boot bands. Well, before that, though, she tossed it on the floor 
and she told us all to step on the flag, to step on it. And we were all crying. We were like, no, no, just, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. And we're like jumping over it. And she's like, no, step on it. And we're like freaking crying. Um, it was like a whole thing. Wow. Yeah. There's more, man. So my birthday falls on in May. And my mom sent me a box full of chocolates, cookies, just stuffed, just all of it. And she's like, shh, puts a letter in there. Happy birthday. I'm so proud of you. Share this with everyone. And because um, the drill instructor, you know, they go through our stuff and they're like, oh, really? <laughs> and so I open it and they're like, oh, OK, meow, meow. All right, we're going to eat it. I don't know why. So they just spread it all around and she let us eat some of it. And I think the next day or was it that same night, she just fucking quarter decked us. <laughs> and at some point, most of us were throwing up, oh. <laughs> like getting up and like throwing up and running to the bathroom. It was, it was wow. like a whole thing. Thanks, mom. Yeah, that was for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I was stationed at Okinawa, Japan. They asked me where I wanted to go after MOS school, and I was like, as far as I can get from my mom. <laughs> so Okinawa, Japan, it was one of my selections, and not a lot of people want to go that far out. So I was able to go out there, and it was really exciting. It was a beautiful place, and I loved my job as motor tea. I, I loved it because <clears throat> you got time to yourself, especially as a driver, you know, you have an A driver, and then there I was with a 710 being trusted as a 19-year-old to drive that through the narrow streets of Okinawa, Japan, and transport troops, millions of dollars of weapons, hazardous material, anything, you name it. And I was just like, wow, I can't believe it. people trusted me at such a young age with that much responsibility and really money and equipment. Mm -hmm. So I loved it. I loved being a motor T. I loved like strapping it down, being really good at my job. Like I really enjoyed it. And um, six months into it, they some they came in. Our our gunnery sergeant came in and they asked if anyone was interested in deploying to Iraq, and that we would be that we would be going with a whole separate unit from who knows where. They didn't even know what we were going to do. They're like, who wants to go? And only three of us <laughs> raised our hands, and we were all PFCs. Um, so we were the only three from my platoon, and then they, they had to pick a sergeant. So there was a sergeant that also went left from my platoon, so there was only four of us. And, and I volunteered because, like I said, I joined because of 9-11, and I wanted to go to war. I ever since that happened because I took it so personally because I would never get to hear my father tell me that story of them and the skyscraper my mom told me that not only that I also would never get to see see the twin towers that's what really pissed me off so I was like I want to go to I want to go for that to go to war for that but I also I'm a first generation here American my parents migrated here and at a very young age, I understood the privilege I had of being born on this side of the soil and having a social security number. Because mm. for a period of time, my cousins who came to this country from El Salvador as well, they were undocumented. And we lived in a house that had a backyard. And we, the laundry room that was in the back, we put that outside. So my aunt and his wife would sleep in there with their daughter. And then the boys would sleep in the backyard. <laughs> under this like awning and they put up like curtains and they just slept outside in the backyard and you know they didn't go to school like I did they didn't they really I, I noticed the difference and I felt like I because I, I didn't have like a lineage in this country like 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 other people do I felt like I had to earn it and and I was very grateful mm. and so there's a couple of reasons that that I joined and that was another one is I wanted to earn my family my bloodlines right to be here because mm. you know tension out there yeah with um 
the border and immigrants and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I understood at a young age, at a young age, the privilege I had. And that was one of the reasons I also raised my hand. And what happened next was really unfortunate. Uh, we had to check out of our unit really quickly. <sighs> and uh, I don't really talk about this a lot, so I get a little, excuse me if I get a little. No problem. Emotional or whatever. So we're packing up real quick, in, within a week, once we got the go. And uh, we were completely checked out go through the whole thing, pack up our stuff, put it in storage, go through the whole checkout sheet, everything's turned in, we have our flights, we're leaving the next morning, and we're going to go out in town. So I'm, uh, I'm at, we're in Okinawa, at the barracks, and we're at, where the entrance is, right? The, the duty, oh, what is, what is it called? D um, duty hut? Yeah, the person in charge though in the barracks, D I can't remember, oh my gosh. Sergeant of the Guard or? Yes, the person there that's on duty to make sure that everyone's logging in and out and make sure the bags are secured mm -hmm. at all hours. I'm sorry, I cannot remember that's that. That's all right. Um, I remember I was down there because my, my girlfriend and I, who had, we're, we volunteered together, we were going to go out in town. And the sergeant comes down and he's like, well, we're going to go out in town. You should come with us. And we're like, and we're like, um, because we're like E2s, we're PFCs, you know, and he's a E5. He's like, don't worry about it. I got you guys. You know, don't worry about the curfew because out in Okinawa, you have the Cinderella curfew where if you don't have a gold card, which is, you, is given to someone that's like an E4 and above, um, if you don't have that, you need to be on base before midnight. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called like the Cinderella curfew. He's like, don't worry about that. I got you guys. So we go outside and, and his vehicle's outside and there were other people joining us who were also all um, e, E3s and below. Uh, so we get in the car. We get in the car with him and, he, and we roll, roll down to pick up his girlfriend. She, you know, she was a local. And she gets in the vehicle and we head off base. And uh, unbeknownst to all of us, we hear a voice in the, from the back of the vehicle. And, I don't know, he does something loud to startle the freaking bejesus out of all of us. And we get all scared. And we're like, oh, my God. Um, and it was this Marine that was on restriction. He should have never left base. So we're like, oh, snap. Um, and, you know, we just kept rolling. This is what's happening. And we go to a karaoke bar. And during that time, the person I was dating, um, he went off that same day. That same day, he went off on to respond to the tsunami in Indonesia. Mm. And so I was in this place like, I'm going to war, I might die, and the love of my life, um, you know, I may never see him again. So I was in this space. So we go to this karaoke kind of singing bar place and we get a room and they, or we order food and we order liquor and I'm just chilling, you know, I'm in my head and someone's like, why aren't you drinking? I'm like, well, I don't really like any of this crap. And they're like, well, what do you like? I'm like, I like orange juice. And they're like, okay, screwdriver. I was like, all right. And they gave me a screwdriver and, you know, it tasted like orange juice. And I could pound a freaking gallon of orange juice, you know, like I did it as a kid and my mom would get so mad at me. <laughs> she would get so mad that I would kill the orange juice like that. Um, anywho, so I am in my feelings, I'm feeling great, I'm 19 years old, not super experienced, um, I was very trusting of, you know, the person, the, the E5. <clears throat> so I get pretty, pretty, pretty blitzed, and I'm stumbling, I'm falling, and there's a point where, like, shit goes black. I don't remember a lot, but I do remember parts and pieces and I remember when we were leaving I had to be assisted out because I remember I was like coming and going and I see a little bit and I remember being outside and I guess I was being combative with my friend um, I wasn't being myself and her, she her she she told me and it, it took us a long time to have this conversation because of the incidents that happened that night 
but she told me that um, that I kept telling her I knew what I was doing, that everything was fine, that I kept repeating my address, and if I was drunk, I wouldn't be able to remember my home address. And she's like, I was about to like sock you, like knock you out, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want her friendship to go down like that. So she was really trying to watch out for me, but I was too drunk. I was way too drunk, and at some point I blacked out. And um, the sar that E5, the sergeant, his him and his girlfriend had gotten into it. So she left at some point. And whatever, if if I tripped and fell on him and things started to happen, you know, I don't remember a lot of that at all. I remember being on the floor for a while and seeing the lights, and then I remember being outside and arguing with my friend. And then I remember being in the honcho because there was a lot of us and we were all packed in there. So there was like three dudes and me on top and then two people in the front because I was kind of laying down across everyone because I wasn't feeling well. And um, I, I would black out and I would wake up just to throw up. I'm not the proudest here. Like I said, I wasn't experienced, but I had never... That this situation, I never seen the situation outside of this moment, and as an observer. But here I am, and I remember just doing that a lot. And the honcho would stop, and I would throw up. And then we got to <clears throat> somewhere where we were going to spend the night because we couldn't go back on base because it was past midnight. Um, and we were a lot of us were underage. I was 19 years old. So. Um, we get to somewhere and um, I had to be carried. So at this point, the E5 takes me and he carries me in. And I remember a little bit of that because I remember like this Japanese lady going into the building, this Japanese lady kind of like, I opened my eyes and she just looked like, you know, she had a very stern look on her face, like what the fuck is going on? You know, like, like disappointment, just a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw her briefly and then I blacked out and then I blacked out. And then I woke up later and I was naked. And I was like, what the fuck happened? So I'm like waking up and I see there's someone else is naked. And I'm just like, what the fuck happened? Oh my God. And I look and it's <clears throat> the sergeant. And I'm just like, oh my God. Oh my God. Like I, f I was like panicking. And I remember I, I went and I went to the bathroom and I was in pain. You know, I was coming to, I didn't know what was going on. And I remember just getting in a tub, running the water and just sitting there. I just sat there with the water running and I washed myself up and I was, I just sat there for a really long time. <sighs> and I was just like, fuck, you know, what am I going to tell the love of my life? You know, it like... It was just you two in there? Yeah, it was just us two. What kind of pain were you feeling? Um, I was feeling pain from my genital area. Mm. And that was... That gosh, you know, when I woke up, I was so shocked and embarrassed and ashamed. And I felt like, you know, way to go, America. <laughs> way to go to putting yourself in a situation. And, you know, trusting, you know someone that I was told I could trust that would take care of me and all this stuff and I really believed it and I grew up without a dad so now I know that I have like daddy issues and validation issues and I can see that now reflecting back then but back then I didn't have that knowledge right so <clears throat> I felt like well this was my fucking fault I'm a fucking idiot this is all my fucking fault I fucked up and um, that's, what I, that's what was going on in my head. And that I'm, you know, what am I going to tell my, the guy I liked? And I, 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 get, I put my clothes back on and I get back into the bed and I pretend I'm asleep. And eventually he gets up and he leaves and he doesn't come back until, um, <clears throat> until it's time for all of us to get in a honcho and go back on base. Like... That's when he's like, hey, we're leaving. And then I just walk out and I'm su everyone's super quiet. Everyone's quiet. It's a very fucking quiet ride. And I was just, I was just like, I don't know what the fuck happened. Like, I didn't have memories. 
you know, now I have a little bit of flashes and all I see is like dark black and red. And it's just like a few glimpses. And, um, was your friend with you when you got back into the honcho? She was, but we really didn't talk. When we, we barely made it back on base to get our shit, get in, get in a honcho and get to the airport because our flight was the next morning. So we're headed to the airport and it's super quiet. Um, we had uh, corpsman buddies. We were attached to a medical battalion. So our, but our buddies see us and they're like, oh, you guys look like shit. Let me give you an IV. You know, hook us up. But I felt like that made me feel way worse. Really? Yes. Um, so we leave, you know, we don't get a chance to say bye to a lot of people super early in the morning and it's very quiet. And then we get to the airport and I must have had a fucking look on my face because the sergeant's like, all three of us are like looking at him as, you know, he's talking to us and he, he, and he looks at me and he says, what did you expect? Special treatment. And I was just like, I'm going to pretend like he said that to all of us and not just to me. I didn't say anything um, and we got on the plane and it was very quiet and I got the courage to go up to him and ask him a very important question <laughs> and the question was did you use protection? I was very 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 concerned that I might end up getting pregnant and not being able to deploy and that was my biggest concern at that moment as well other than what am I going to tell the dude that I'm dating so I go up to him and he's looking at the newspaper and he's just sitting there in his seat. I'm standing in the aisle and I'm like, did you wear protection? And he's like, he's like, yeah, I did. Um, by the way, sorry about that. And he just doesn't even look at me. He's just reading his fucking whatever the fuck he was reading. And at the moment I was like, thank you, Jesus. He wore protection. You know, I'm not going to get an STD. I'm not going to get pregnant. So that was like, thank God. Because... Um, at that time, I didn't, I didn't realize that that was without giving consent, you know, and being of mind. I didn't, it took a long time in therapy to understand that I was raped. Yeah, oh gosh, and wait, there's more. <laughs> um, so my mom along the way, she's like, she was dating this guy with a truck driver. And she had my little sister. They were, he was a truck driver, so they were with him, and they were trucking along, and they were like, where are you flying in when I left? I'm like, oh, I'm going to be at this airport. We're going to head over there. We're going to be there. Okay. You know, so um, at some point, we land somewhere, and they're there, and my mom's there, and my, the guy she's dating, my stepdad's there, um, and my little sister's there. And then it's me, my girlfriend, the, the other Marine that volunteered, and the sergeant. And my mom immediately puts him on a pedestal. So this is like the very next day. She's like, oh, my God, please bring, take care of my daughter. I know she's in good hands. She's a tough girl. Like, she put him on a pedestal. And I'm just standing there watching all this. And I'm just like... This is weird. You know, like, I'm just like, this is, I look like shit. There's a photo of me. I look like fucking shit. Um, you know, and she puts them on that pedestal. And I'm just like, I, there's absolutely nothing, nothing I can do at this very moment. Like, I can't have a reaction. I have to keep my bearing because I don't want to make it a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we carry on and she does all that. And I'm just like, what the fudge? My girlfriend is super pissed at me, too. She's fucking livid. She's like, you're fucking dumb told you we were this and she was mad like she was not talking to me she was from jamaica so if you know you know when they mad they mad mm. and she was my best friend so she was mad um so we weren't talking too much um but then we got to we got to lejeune finally and then the platoon sergeant no longer just had to deal with us he had to deal with a whole bunch of other Marines that were augmented from Okinawa. So that's when I learned that the motor pool next door also got asked, but a lot more people volunteered from, from that motor pool and then they asked other, other areas. So there was like a bunch of motor T um, people that volunteered to deploy and be augmented. And then we got attached to um, 
uh, MP battalion in Camp Lejeune, CLB2, mm -hmm. MP battalion. And then we got, we spent like three weeks there doing some super intense tra weapons training, convoy training, how to search vehicles, you know, all that stuff. Freaking gunning. It was awesome. I freaking loved it. I, and I was able to, you know, I'm like, this is, this is what I'm here for. I'm here to go to war. Fuck all that. I'm not going to let another, another man take something from me. And this is something I really want to fucking do. So, you know, I, I focus. I get through it. I, get, I, under, I pick up all the training. And then we take off. And we get to, you know, the transition part, liberty and all that. And we're processing through, going through everything. It's not too bad. You know, he has a lot of us to deal with now, so I'm not his focus. Uh, or I, you know, he just doesn't have time. But when we get to Iraq, um, the very first night, um, I, I was, I, we went to, I ended up in Camp Al-Assad in 2005, in February. And it was like around Valentine's Day, because I remember being like, wow, this really sucks. <laughs> Everything's just happened, and I'm over here arriving around this time, and we arrived late at night, we dropped our gear, and they showed us, they walked us to the motor pool for the MPs, and that's where, um, that was the first time I, I met this other sergeant, he was an MP sergeant, and I don't know what happened, but at some point we go to the motor pool, they sit us somewhere, we're waiting, as usual, and this sergeant comes out. It's the first night we're freaking there. And the sergeant comes out and he's like, who the fuck is PFC Flores? And I get up, I run over there and I do my whole report thing. Um, and he's like, go to the mech bay. Like, fuck. Like, where's the mech bay? You just put it over there. So I, I go over there and I'm just standing there. The light, the, the light was on and he comes in, and there, another corporal comes in, and he just starts leaning in on me. You're a piece of shit. You don't fucking belong here. I don't want you in my platoon. All this fucking shit. And I'm like, I, he looks like he wants to hit me. One, in my mind, I'm like, what is going on? And why is this guy yelling at me? And then he, um, and he looks like he wants to hit me. And I was like, you know, I told you about my mom. So that's the kind of attitude I had. I'm like, if this fool hits me, I'm going to fight back. I'm going to fight until he fucking kills me. Um, but he doesn't touch me. But, you know, he's just leaning in on me. And I never understood why he did that. Still? No, now I know. Probably, oh. I, now I, you know, I can only, what is it called? Where you like, you can only like, Trying to piece the... Process it together? Yeah, it trying together. to piece it all together. Like, I've never seen him in my life before. And this guy just does that. And um, he leaves and I finally, you know, I look like I'm going through a lot. And this corporal, he, he's like, all right, you know, I'm going to walk with you, you know. And he's trying to, like, console me. And we're walking back to the barracks. And I'm just like, get the fuck away from me. I don't fucking know you. I trust you. So we walk back, and um, my the sergeant, he was the, he was very much an alpha, and you know we were all young, and I totally contribute the treatment that I got from my peers out there due to group thinking and also the fact that you know he he was an MP, he was a sergeant, he was a badass motherfucker, <laughs> you know, um, and so he was very open about disliking me and giving me extra duties and just really leaning into me. Uh, so I feel like I got some special attention the first couple of months. Like I would get in trouble for the, the ridiculous things. Why? Um, I, I believe what happened is when we got that, that sergeant believed that I slept with him for special treatment. I truly believe he thought that. And he said it, you know? So when I was like in processing my therapy, I was like, what would make someone do that? You know what would make someone do that, Krishna? I was like, if that sergeant went and told this sergeant what happened. Mm, that's what I was thinking. That little bitch right there. Yeah, that one right there slept with me for special treatment. Um, so for a few months, you know, the sergeant was really tough on me. 
and it put me in a place where I felt like I was worthless. You know, um, sh men did that to me when I was a kid. Men did this to me now. Like, there's no hope out there. You know, so I was. You're a boot. <coughs> sorry, to, boot. you're a boot PFC. Yeah. It feels like shit to be a boot PFC when you're a fucking dude in the Marines. Yeah. You know, uh, I couldn't imagine how you were feeling uh, as a female boot PFC after something like this just happened. That's blows and It was my just mind. back to back, you know? I'm just like, what the fuck? So I was just in a space where, you know, as a child, I also struggled with depression and self-harm. So those thoughts were immediate. You know, I'm a piece of shit. I'm worthless. You know, I'm, I'm just here trying to do my best to be a badass Marine. And, you know, I keep getting knocked down. And it led to me really being in a dark place and being bloodthirsty, being super aggressive, mean, and also, um, uh, I guess, something suicidal. I felt like the only thing I can do with my life at that time was to die in combat. That's it. I'm gonna die out here. That's what I want. So I've, I, I walked into, I volunteered for anything and everything. I did convoy security. So that's all I did. Uh, and, you know, I eventually worked my way up and to, to the scout vehicle. And I was, um, Eventually, because of my work ethic and the fact that I, I didn't, obviously whatever was said about me and originally perceived about me being a little hoe uh, was not true. So eventually, like, they, after like three months, they kind of just backed off, but the damage was done because my peers didn't treat me very well. Um, I only had one or two real, I had a, I had a fire team that was cool with me. That corporal that walked with me, I ended up in his fire team, and he took me under his wing, and he really watched out for me. So there was a few, few good people. For him. Yeah, there was a few people, and I also had my my very good friend that I made out there. Um, he was my fucking my real battle buddy. Like w the women obviously were separated, so we were this huge platoon out of like 60 of us. There was only five women, and we were all in the same room, and the guys, you know, were everywhere. And sometimes we would, sometimes we would be the ones on call for recovery missions or emergency missions. Um, and when that happened, none of my peers would bother to be like, go get Flores. Only my very good friend would be the one to do that. And if he wasn't there for whatever reason, because he was on a different mission, he got pulled for something else, it, I would have to ask someone like, hey, hey, can you please remember to get me? And, um, you know, the conversations that the guy, the questions they would ask me on convoys were very inappropriate. And as a woman Marine and trying to survive everything, you know, I stripped all of my femininity, but I also, that also didn't mean that I liked talking to them and listening to all that shit. So a lot of the times I would volunteer to, to, to gun a lot. So I loved gunning because I didn't have to listen to any of that shit that went on down there. They would talk about their sexual experiences, their fucking dicks or how they have a chubby in the convoy krishna who who would you fuck are you a lesbian like this is ridiculous questions and you're just like leave me alone Ugh. um so i gunned a lot and i loved it and i would put on i would put on a headphone and at night uh, the stars out there it's like wow so even in the midst of like being out there doing what i do and being you know in, in, in the line of danger, um, there was moments where I found peace, mm -hmm. especially up there on a turret. Yeah. Yeah. And what was, what was your experience like conducting these missions? You know, what, what was that like? Um, so all of the women were separated, except for one squad had two women, and there were the, the uh, there were MPs, that was their MOS, and, the, and the, three, the other three of us were augmented. So we were all separated, except for one squad had two, those two MP girls. Um, so when my squad, squad two, two rolled out, I was the only female in my squad. 
So I was there to do everything else that the males were doing, but also, you know, be there to search the women, engage with the women, the children, and all that stuff. So, like I said, I was in the space where I wanted to die because that was the most honorable thing. You know, pin my medals to my chest, tell my mama I did my best. Like, I felt like that was, that was all I could get out of life at that time. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I got lucky a lot. There were several times where it should have been me, but it wasn't. And I struggled a lot with survivor's guilt um, when I got out, uh, when I got out because we did lose a warrant officer. I wasn't there for that. But um, I do remember that it, it, I felt like I should have been there. You know, like I should have been there, but I was stuck doing duty. Mm. You know, they left me behind <laughs> watching the freaking barracks area. And then we lost another Marine. And that Marine, um, <laughs> when I first met him, when we got to Lejeune, <laughs> His name tape, his last name was Tucker, but his name tape, you know how it was Digi? There just happened to be a dark Digi, like, where it made the T look like an F. And the first time I met him, I was like, your name is Fucker? <laughs> he did not, immediately, he did not like me. And he was a super square, serious Lance Corporal. He was older than us, too. Uh, we did not get along. Um, but there was this one night where they were paying Texas this whole home, home? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it. I didn't know how to play. And look, you want to play? I'll teach you. And I was like, okay. You know, and I went in with $5 and I came out with 10 and Tucker, that was the first time Tucker and I like connected, got along, you know, didn't just stare at each other awkwardly. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was like, that was really fun. I got $10. Heck yes. Let's do this again tomorrow night. And he's like, all right, cool. Tomorrow night, another lesson. And so the next morning, you know, we're at, at the motor pool. He's getting ready to go on a convoy. And I see him and I'm like, hey, what's up? I'm going to get back tonight. He's like, all right, cool. And, you know, I was like, well, stay safe out there. And I gave him a hug. And, um, yeah, he, he, didn't, he didn't come back. And I didn't get to play with him the next day. So it was like, it was just, you know, it's, it's, it's just odd because I was like, we had so much potential, you know, like I was just getting to know him. Mm. And, you know, one day he's there and you're making plans to, to meet up and then they're gone. Yeah. So that was that was really rough. And then there was another incident where um, with the survivor's guilt, where, like I said before, I hadn't worked. To me, it felt like I had to work my way up to the front. I had to prove myself. I had to prove to all these men that when I cleared this over here, I cleared it and shit ain't gonna go off. It took a lot for that, for me to get that. So when I got to the, to the front, I felt like I had really earned it. And I was there for a reason. And um, this one day we were on a convoy. My, I'm, I'm usually no problem being in a scout vehicle ahead of the convoy. But this one day, um, someone found out that there was a girl in the front and they didn't feel comfortable with that. And they were like, so um, they stopped the convoy right outside the wire. Like, we already had our brief. We're rolling out of the motor pool. We're at the gate. And we stop. I'm like, what is going on? Okay. So we're just waiting. And then my buddy comes running up. Hey, we're switching out. And I'm like, why? I'm like, I don't know. They just said we're switching out. And I was like, oh, <clears throat> grab my shit. And I'm like, this is bullshit because that's my fire team. I want to be with my fire team. Um, so they put me, I don't remember the fuck, I think I was behind the lead vehicle. No, I was in front of it. I don't know where I was, but I wasn't the scout, and then the commander was behind me. And there, and you know, we had the little radio thing, so I'm sitting um, on a Humvee, a grenade catcher, right? It had up armored, and only went up to here, you could see our heads, you know, we're just sitting there, like, a bunch of, like, we're completely full. And I sit down, and I'm like, this is bullshit. Go to the, from being in the front and on the radio to being in the back. And I was just like, this is bullshit. And they're like, hey, they want you to raise your hand. I fucking just put up the finger. Yeah. Way to go. Way to go, Flores. You just, you just uh, ha what is it, flipped off the commander or whoever. And I was just like, man, it just keeps getting worse. You know? And so that day, um, 
my 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 team got hit that day when we were on our way to KV. Um, and I remember because I, I I remember I could see them. I saw what was going on. And I was like, oh, something's going on. And you know they roll in, and then boom, it goes. The IED goes off, and I saw it. I don't remember the order, but I remember like I saw it flash. I saw the sonic wave, and and then I felt the sound. Like I felt it, like all three stages. And I remember the hum our Humvee was still rolling when that happened because I remember I stood up and I put my foot on the bench because I just wanted to jump out of the vehicle, like, but it was still moving. Um, so as soon as it stopped, we ran up to, to the Humvee and by the time I got there, Marines had already surrounded him, uh, my buddy. So the buddy that I switched out with, he took my seat and he took most of the blast. Um, luckily that day, no one, no one passed. Um, he was the, the one most physically injured. Um, he ended up losing, having shrap metal in his head, all over his body. Um, the driver also got a lot of shrap metal. Um, three, three out of four of them that were injured were medevaced. Um, and when I ran up to, to the Marines, when, by the time I got to them, they were already working on my buddy that switched out switched out with me and they had him completely surrounded and they were like, we need more, uh, me like the med kits, med kits. And I was, I caught up and as we were running, we were also trying to, there was a group of us trying to go to a bunker out to the right of us because um, there was like a pack of cars and a bunker and we suspected that's where the, the, the enemy was, the trigger man. So, I'm running by, I'm listening, hear, hearing a mask for that. So I rip mine off and I throw it into the, into the group. I just throw it and I start running. And me and my other buddy, we ran off up this hill because it happened right by a bridge. So we climb over the hill and then we start running towards the bunker. It's, it's, it felt like the longest run on the planet that day. But we were just running, running, and eventually a Humvee spat by us as we were getting closer to, to the bunker, and they, they went towards the vehicles. Went towards the vehicles, and we cleared the bunker. Um, by the time we got back, they had already been medevaced. And we were really close to, to, our, to the camp. Uh, we were like maybe less than 10 miles out. So... And by the time we got back, there was only, like, the convoy had moved on. They were already there. Now we're just playing catch-up. And, um, yeah, it was really hard that day. We didn't know if anyone was going to make it. Um, and we were, we were pissed. So for many years, you know, I struggled with that because I was like, you know, I'm the one that wanted to, you know, to die. Um, why did it have to be you? And... And I didn't talk to my buddy, like we never really talked about it, even because, you know, when I saw him again, it was when we were coming back and we were back on Camp Lejeune and he happened to be there and we talked a little bit, but we just didn't talk about that too much. We did a little bit, but it wasn't like, I didn't, I didn't have those feelings yet, you know? And it wasn't until later that I struggled a lot with survivor skills. I'm like, that should have been me. And then there was another time where, um, you know, we, my Humvee, and I was the gunner, I was looking at it, and I'm like, ooh, wires, wires, you know, and I'm calling it in, and they're, like, pulling me in, and like, get in here, dumbass, you know, uh, and we missed the pressure, the, the saw blades that were on the floor, and we pulled over, and we told the convoy to stop, we had EOD with us, and EOD rolls up, and um, we were rookies, so they didn't really um, trust our, you know, our, um, our experience, our abilities, our skills. So they rolled up with their windows down, and unfortunately, they were hit. Yeah, and uh, um, the the gun was completely blown off. Um, we had casualties that day. Um, that was the first time I ever saw um, a dead body, a mm. dead marine. Um, and what happened is I was the gunner, and the we were out somewhere else when the bomb went off. So when we came back, um, everybody just got out. The gunner from the other scout vehicle got out too, just to assist. And as for what I remember is, you don't leave a cruise serve weapon unmanned. So this was happening, like we pulled up this way, so everyone runs out, I'm still on the gun, and I turn around 
and I watch from where we just came from because um, we had detainees by this point. So I'm like, you don't leave, you don't leave a crew enforcement, crew, crew, oh, crew, crew weapon? Crew serve weapon. Crew serve weapon unmanned. So I turn around and I'm watching this side, making sure that we, there's nothing else coming this way. So after everything's done and over with, that sergeant comes over to me and he's like, why the fuck didn't you get out of the Humvee and help? Blah, 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 blah. And my only response was, you don't leave a crew serve weapon unmanned. And I was covering an area that was not secure. <laughs> no one was paying attention. So after I kind of said that, like, you don't leave a crew serve weapon unsecured, he just looked at me and he just walked away. And I was just like, damn if I do, damn if I don't. Hmm. You know, if I would have gone out, you left a crew serve weapon. Yeah. So I did what I had to survive the Marine Corps. Um, but I also, when I came back, I, I struggled with substance abuse. Because one, when you come back, you're not talking about anything, your feelings or any like that. That's just not the environment, nor the, the, the what, was, what we thought we should do to make sure that we get back home. Because if you start talking all this nonsense that, you know, you're having these thoughts or whatever, you stay long, you don't get cleared. You don't get to go on leave. You don't get to go home. So, you know, you cover up the red flags. So when I got back, um, unfortunately, uh, I came back to the same platoon that the sergeant and I came from. And we were, we had been back for a while and I was out and about on a weekend and you know, I was at on the base bar in Camp Hansen. I don't remember the Palm. I think it was called. And um, I was there, and I saw the sergeant come in. And I remember being like getting overwhelmed and getting upset. So I grabbed a beer. I turned 20 in Iraq. So when I get I got back, I still wasn't 21. So I grabbed a beer and I took a swig. And OOD just happened to freaking catch me. Hey you! I didn't have the wristband. <laughs> hey you! And I got in trouble for that. And um, the reason I was so upset about that was because when the boyfriend I had, when that incident happened before we left Okinawa, he found out. And I told him what happened, what I remember. And then other people were like, nah, she wanted that shit, blah, 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 you know. So eventually he ended up break, like, believing what was rumored back, in, back, at camp, back at the garrison in Camp Hansen. So we broke up, and that really hurt me, too. So I felt very alone out there. Um, so when I saw him, that happened, and then I ended up getting in trouble and getting investigated, and I almost got NJP'd. But they deemed maybe I wasn't drinking. So I, I, I was put on restriction. There was an investigation and all this stuff. But at the end, they were like, okay, there's not enough evidence to firmly say that you were underage drinking. Um, so the transition was hard, but my PTSD was so bad. I was so angry. I was pissed. I was so mad at everything that happened and how unfair everything was. And the survivor's guilt, the moral injury from some of the things I had to do out there that I'm, I, I, you know, I dehumanized people. Like, I, I was a whole, like, I was just, I was really mad. And I was struggling with PTSD. Um, I struggled with depression as a kid and self-harm. So obviously I was struggling with that as an adult. And I thought about, you know, every day, why the fuck didn't I die in 2005? And it's like 2010 now, and then 15, and then 17. And at some point, I reach out to my buddy that switched out with me. And I, Cause I, was, I had it, I had had it. I was like, why were we switched out that day? I need to know. So I reached out through Facebook and I was like, hey, do you remember like what happened? Why were we switched out? And he's like, <clears throat> he's like, he said that, um, that one that he asked, that he had asked to be in a front. So there's that. And then he said that in a way, what happened to him changed his life because he said before that happened to him, that he was going down the wrong path 
Like he was not gonna, he wasn't gonna make it either. Um, but he said when that happened to him, like he said that it changed him, which changed his trajectory in life. So if anything, he's, he, you know, he says that, he said that in a way it's like also saved his life. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, what the fudgesticles this whole time? I've been beating myself up, you know, and, and this is it. And I was just like, wow, you know, well, I'm like, I'm glad you're married and you made it and you have a baby and all this good stuff. But I was just like, you know, maybe it's time to let some of this stuff go. Did that make you feel better about it? I don't know. You know, I had really mixed feelings and I had to process those feelings and I almost felt like, I don't know, I felt I had some really complicated feelings that I don't, uh, it's very hard to like share because it's really weird. But um, when he said that, it, it felt, it almost felt like, okay, then this is, this is my chance. This is my chance to go back to the VA and see if I can figure out how I can help myself not take my own life because I was really close to taking my own life. I was just not not going to make it. I failed at my first semester of college and I couldn't even sit through a class because I would get so mad at people for talking or being disrespectful and I just I just couldn't couldn't and I was also abusing substances. I couldn't leave the house or or go to class without smoking before every class. So I was not doing okay. So there's there was a point where I really wanted to hurt myself and I thought, "Well, you know what? I was raised Catholic, so you know I have that. But I also thought to myself, like you know, there my brothers, some of my brothers didn't come home, and if I take my life, like this is them, the you know, the enemy winning, and I should be living the best life I can. Mm. So I finally, after like failing to for going, I went to the VA prior to all this stuff too, but the VA kind of dropped the ball on me. The VA was very dismissive of my experience when I went to ask for help um, and they were like, there's no way you did all that. I was just like, everywhere I went, nobody believed what I did, you know? And um, it really frustrated me that they didn't take me seriously. And, and I, was a I, was in a, I was a very combative patient. I was very angry, very aggressive, and I would push them. I would push them to lose their bearing and act out too. So there were times where like one cussed at me <laughs> And there was another time where like I would be so pent up like I need to like release this vow and I'd show up for my appointment and they forgot to call me to tell me that my therapist isn't there and here I am ready to you know burst and I would get so freaking mad and, and I was like yeah I would get just super mad so I left I left the VA a couple of times really really mad where I was like nothing they can't do shit There's, this therapy shit's not going to help. That's just for weak people, you know, the stigma that you pick up when you're in the military about mental health. So, but it wasn't until I, I was really going to take my life that I was like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and I'm going to give it this shit a try because I never finished a treatment. I would start a treatment, but I would not complete a treatment. And you need to complete a treatment to see any type of progress. So I committed and for like two years. I was going to some intensive therapy like every week. There was a time when I was going twice a week. So as I, when I finally found a provider that I felt like I could connect with, and it was a woman, a civilian woman. I didn't want to work with any uh, military-related individuals because we all have our own biases, and I'm like, I don't want to sit here and think this person's trying to judge me. So I met this, this doctor, and she was, com she was completing her post-doctorate. So she was, you know, she was there interning, getting her experience. Um, so she was very by the books. And I got, the, because she was a student, I got, to, I got extra time with her, you know, which isn't normal uh, with, as a VA process. Um, I got to work for a really long time with her. And together, I used to say that she, she saved my life, but she made me realize that together we saved my life. And going to treatment and really giving and really just pushing through it and, and how hard the feelings were and what you discover about yourself and looking 
looking at your, your demons, you know, and facing them and addressing them, all of your flaws and weaknesses and your perceptions and where that comes from. Like, I went through it all. Um, I did exposure therapy where you talk about your trauma, and mine was the, the assault. And I, I, I did that for however many weeks I had to do it, where I would repeat this, the incident detail by detail over and over and over, and then I would have to listen to it. So I, I would try to create a gap, you know, not physically feel like it's happening again. Then um, I did exposure therapy where once I had completed like cognitive processing therapy, behavioral therapy, exposure, uh, prolonged exposure, um, I finally started doing like um, exposure therapy and recreational therapy. And when I started stepping into that, I was really working towards breaking, breaking these, these um, behaviors I had developed as survival tactics. So something simple like going to the grocery store. You go into the grocery store, you don't have to buy anything, but you got to walk around. And I would do it. I didn't like people looking at me, so I would do it with my sunglasses on. And eventually it was, okay, now do it without your sunglasses on for this amount of time. And next time, okay, it was 15 minutes, now we're going to do 20 minutes, and I have to do that for a whole week or two weeks or whatever. And slowly and slowly, I would conquer little things, and I would get a new assignment, a new type of exposure. Um, so then I ended up in it, really stepping out and like participating in with organizations that focus on recovering veterans, either with physical or, um, or mental health issues. <clears throat> so I started cycling, and with the cycling group, I was given access to retreats. So they would put together these women veterans retreats, and I would go, and it was really sad. All these women, like a group of badass women, are there, you know, we're cycling, and a lot of us, you know, were at the place where they were able to share their story. I wasn't. I was so mad. I was so mad. It was very closed off. I was not friendly. I was very angry. And I would get even madder when I would hear that my sisters had these experiences too. But it was also them sharing their story that made, gave me hope. Especially when they were sharing that they were on the maintenance side of recovery. You know, the stages of change. They were on that side. And you know, I was like, damn, you know, she's, it was this particular woman, she was in the army, she deployed to Iraq, she did Motor T2, so, and I just, I, I met her, and I, like, I thought she was super cool, and she gets up, and she shares her story, and I was just like, man, if shit, if she can do it, I can do it, too, and that's when um, I really started to see, like, me practicing all these tools that I gained along the way, and um, I've been doing that ever since. Nice. Mm -hmm. The tools are useless unless you put them to work, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm still, I'm still looking for tools. I'm, st I'm always looking for way, uh, treatment modalities that maybe are, you know, uh, holistic or, you know, experimental, lights, biofeedback, meditation, yoga, like things that I thought were like whatever. Now I practice on a regular basis. It's part of my, my mental health uh, because with all of these, without all of these things, I wouldn't be the person that you see right now in mm. front of you. On a daily basis, I'm constantly troubleshooting these, trying to bake these old patterns. You know, you know, I know all this new stuff, so I'm trying to create new neural pathways but when, when, it, you know, when it's a lot of time that you, you've gone not processing, you know, those grooves are pretty deep. Mm -hmm. So it takes time. Right. And I can definitely say that I am a totally different person than I was back then. And I wouldn't be here. Although the VA failed me when I first went to it, I also wouldn't be here without all the support that the VA gave me. Because of my experience going through the VA, I felt like a lot of my sisters also get, have really bad experiences. And I was yeah. like, I would sit in the lobby and I would listen to, of course, the Vietnam vets, you know. Oh, and then I would be like, yeah, yeah, I get all riled up too. And then I was like, 
sitting there, I'm like, but what can I do about it? So it motivated me to kind of figure out what I wanted to do for schooling. Mm -hmm. And I ended up eventually obtaining my bachelor's in public health promotion. And then I ended up also obtaining my graduate degree in health um, health administration. Nice. So I was like, what, how, what can I do? What part can I play in the VA? So I was like, I don't know, but... You know, I can't, I'm not going to become a doctor or a nurse, but I can do health administration. Maybe I can fix, help fix bottlenecks, issues, problems in the system. Mm. So, and that's the journey that I'm on now. You know, I have the privilege of being selected for a leadership development program through the VA called the Graduate Health Administration Training Program. And for, it's an internship for 12 months. You get to work with the director's office. That's the medical director of Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. Wow. I know. It's an extreme honor and privilege to, to be there. Yeah. And I've, I've learned so much about the VA. It is massive. And, you know, I'm, I'm motivated. I'm motivated to stay focused and to, to help improve how we deliver healthcare to our veterans. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, any last words? Something that helps me stay focused is that um, during COVID, I kind of, I kind of took this, this kind of mantra that that we a lot of us say when we're in combat is um, complacency kills. You know, it's something that you're always told and you're always running through your head trying to remember not to freaking, you know, get lazy, and um, that's that's what you know we say and keeps us alive in Iraq or in our deployments. So during COVID. Um, you know, a lot of people were struggling with their mental health and all that stuff. And I, w I got this shirt that said, uh, complacency kills. And I was on that bike, that same bike you have right there. And I was, I was doing my little workout, my little online workout, because, you know, I can't go to the gym anymore. And I had to get this bike. And I'm, and I'm like, I got to do this for my mental health. I got to do this for my mental health. And I'm just staring at myself. And I'm like trying to, you know, kill it, kill it, kill it. And I read the shirt. Complacency kills. And I was like, oh my God. If I, if I get complacent with my mental health and what helps my mental health, it can kill me. Mm. So if you can find something, anything that maybe helped you when you were at your hardest times and somehow in a way apply it to your present time, like to me right there, for me, I was like, okay, I can apply this on this end too. And and ever my physical physical exercise is 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 a big part of keeping myself balanced and my mental health on check so whatever works for you sometimes it's not prescriptions sometimes it's maybe holistic approaches or there or you know traditional therapy just try try it all commit to it if you commit to a treatment do your very best to complete it it's super important that's when you're going to see, see any, that's where you're going to see growth. That's where you're going to be like, oh my God, like, this kind of worked. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard and you're going to have to be consistent on it. But if you feel like you're missing structure, what, what, I can't see a better way to figure out structure than making sure you're taking care of yourself so you can love the people around you. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Krishna. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared. Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair. Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear. Take me your way cause I don't like here. Ghost of my past, they feeling the night air. Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares.